To those who fell in the Battle of Scarville, the stone memorial read, Your sacrifices were not in vain. October 24, 1918 through October 27, 1918, above the base stood a statue of an American soldier with a round cap and a long rifle with a bayonet attached. His face had a perpetual scowl, his eyes slightly squinted as the statue looked at something far off in the distance. I heard a throat clearing. I looked around in confusion. Beautiful memorial, eh? A voice said from behind me. I turned and saw an ancient looking man in a suit. His face had so many wrinkles that it reminded me of a raisin. His ears and nose stood out massively on his shaking frame. I wondered just how old this man really was. Yes, it certainly is, I admitted, glancing once more at the shining marble statue which seemed to glow under the bright summer sun. But what is the Battle of Scarville? I've never even heard of it. The ranger shook his head sadly at this. Most of you younger people haven't, he said gruffly, but my family was involved in the Battle of Scarville. If you have a few minutes, I can tell you all about it. He motioned to a bench next to the statue, one that I could have sworn wasn't there just a few seconds earlier. I shrugged it off though, admitting to myself that I might have missed it due to the glare of the sun, which was slowly disappearing behind the trees. We both sat down. He told me his name was Franklin, and I told him mine was Ted. We shook after we had introduced ourselves, the small, bird-like bones of his fragile hand feeling almost weightless under my grasp. And then Franklin began to tell me a story that would change my life forever. I was just a kid when this happened. My father was a soldier in the area, but he never liked to talk about what he did. Then one day, he came running in the living room, his eyes all wide, telling me and my mom to get all our stuff, quick, it was time to go, and all this other nonsense. My mother asks why, he starts screaming gibberish about monsters and this and that, and my mother says the strangest goddamn thing. Oh, is it that time again? Right then, the shaking starts outside. Oh God, it's too late, my father says, and he puts his face in his hands, crying. Now my father was not a man who ever cried. I didn't even see him cry at my grandfather's funeral. He was made of stone, one of the toughest men I will ever know. So when he started crying, I knew something bad was happening. The sky started to go dark, as if there were a solar eclipse. My mom grabs a canvas bag and starts trying to go around the house, grabbing some food and drinks. But my dad yells, says we have no time for that. He tells her to grab his other gun, the 12 gauge in the closet upstairs. He runs downstairs and grabs his rifle, shoving a magazine in it and standing at the door, straight as a board and as pale as a sheet. The sky seemed to go dark, even though it was still over an hour until sunset. Out of the darkness, I saw silhouettes, stumbling shapes with twisted legs, broken arms, long necks and strange eyes. They continued forward, at a much faster pace than any walking man. Their eyes seemed to glow in the dark, and the closer they got, the more hypnotized I felt. There was a strange, pulsating light that came out of their faces, you see. If you stared at it too long, you would get carried away by that light. My dot, though, didn't hesitate for a moment. He started shooting as soon as they were within range of the 30-06. The nearest one's head exploded in a shower of dark blood. The rest of them began hissing like snakes and running forwards. My da empties his whole magazine, taking down six of them, then slams and locks the door. Where's that fucking gun? He screamed. My ma came running down the hallway with the big black thing in one hand and a box full of slugs in the other. He grabs the gun from her hand and gives it to me. You know how to shoot, boy, he says. Now is the time for you to prove yourself. Protect your family and home. By this point, dozens of those things are slamming on the other side of the door, still hissing and gurgling in some strange language I've never heard before. I nodded at my dad and started slamming slugs into the shotgun. They were practically breaking the door down by this point. The lock had started to bust and twist, and the door was separating from the threshold. 
A couple more good hits and it would have been all over the floor anyway. I know a good slug will shoot through doors, hell, they'll shoot through walls, so I point the shotgun at the door, point blank, and begin shooting through the door. Some of those things start screaming and falling over, dead, exit wounds the size of grapefruit in their backs and chests. But the door is in a sorry state by this point, full of massive holes and splintering apart. I had to reload, and they started busting through, coming into the house. Now that they were close, I could tell they were not human, though from a distance they almost looked human. But they had these strange, pulsating black veins going up their neck and stretching out across their face, and their eyes were all the same silver color, glowing as if they had some inner light. It wasn't just a reflection, like you see with some animals at night who run in front of your headlights. This light was coming from within them, and it was bright. Some of them had blood caked around their mouths, running down their clothes and the entire fronts of their bodies, whose blood I didn't yet know, but when I saw the casualties in the town later on, I would figure it out. Just when I thought we were going to be overwhelmed, my neighbor and some of his family members ran over. He starts screaming at me from the yard, firing his gun at the creatures in a frenzy of violence. He had his two sons with him, and they all had shotguns. They were whooping and hollering, blowing the creatures apart with buckshot. When one of them stopped to reload, the other two would cover them, so that they had a nearly constant rate of fire. My da and I ran out the door, shooting and reloading. I saw the skull of the nearest creature disintegrate as I fired into its head from less than five feet away, but its eyes seemed to hover in the air a moment after it was gone. It reminded me of the Cheshire Cat from Alice in Wonderland, how its face seemed to hang in the air after its body had gone. By this point, we had finished off the entire group of them. A couple dozen bodies lay around us. My heart was beating and my blood was up. I could almost relate to the sons of my neighbor. Part of me wanted to whoop and holler too. Part of it was fun and exciting, even though I knew that one wrong move would mean likely death. I used the break in the action to move closer to one of the corpses and look at it. In its basic shape, it looked human, but up close you could tell it was no such thing. For one thing, they all had six fingers on each hand, and they were twisted, long things. They almost looked vampiric, and, as I would find out later, that was right on the money, or at least as close to it as we could understand. Their skin had thin black veins running every which way, and they appeared to all be wearing some sort of coarse brown cloth, formed into shapeless pants and shirts. They even covered their feet with it, though they had some sort of leather on the bottom. It didn't look like any leather I had ever seen, however. It shone and shimmered, and it looked inflexible and thick. It looked chitinous. Out in the field, we heard a sound like a screaming woman. It broke the silence and caused us all to jump, spinning around and pointing our guns. But what we saw there was no scared lady. It was some sort of animal, standing over 10 feet tall. It looked like some huge praying mantis, except its hide was shiny and black. Massive pinchers extended from the front of its face, big enough to chop a man in half down the middle I reckon. The eyes were huge and black, but as the light moved across them, they seemed to shimmer like rainbows. What in God's name is that? My da yelled, but the neighbors only shook their heads in amazement. Then one of the boys, a red-headed and skinny lad by the name of Wesley, said something that caught me off guard. I saw some of those things coming out of the caves, he said. I looked at him, eyes wide. So did everyone else. When I was fishing earlier at the stream, I thought it was just people exploring the tunnels at first, until I saw their eyes and those veins. His father grabbed his shoulder and shook him. When was it? His father asked him, looking scared and uncertain. How long ago, son? His son shook his head slowly, trying to remember. An hour ago, maybe, Wesley said. As soon as I saw them, I started running home. And not five minutes after I got there, they started coming across the yard. People from town were running down the road now, screaming in terror and pain. I saw them driven on like herds of sheep, and our giant praying mantis friend also noticed. Its head went up, antennae flicking, head cocked to the side in a way that would have been comical in other circumstances. Its pinchers moved faster, opening and closing constantly, as if it were trying to taste the air. Then it started running. It was just a black blur in the dim light, 
Flying across the yard at an impossible speed, I couldn't even see its legs moving. It grabbed the nearest person, a young woman with huge terrified eyes, and used its pincers to snap her head right off. The decapitated head rolled across the ground, an expression of mortal terror still etched into her expression. Then the mantis creature began to suck at the bleeding stump of her neck drinking until it looked like the body was sucking in on itself, until the skin was pale and bloodless as a mannequin. The other people were stumbling and running around it, still praying and cursing and shrieking, but it took no notice of them. Once it was full, it looked bigger, more swelled up, like a tick. Its chitinous black shell seemed to expand, looking more rounded, and it even looked a little more red in the pale light as if the blackness of its hide had lightened into a shade of darkest crimson. We're being invaded by vampires, I screamed. Everyone looked at me but no one argued. They didn't even have time to. At that moment, the next wave started. Our home was on a road with houses every few hundred feet, a forest behind the houses and a grassy field on the other side. The road itself sat between the field and the homes. The trees pressed in on the houses, being only 20 or 30 feet behind them. The woods were old and thick with brush and prickers and endless ferns. It was hard enough to see in it at daytime, but it was now nearly night, and trying to see into it was a fool's errand. The enemy used our disadvantage to surprise us. We had all reloaded of course and we had five men with guns. I wished I had another one to give to my ma, who stood behind my da. Both of them looked scared and far too pale. I saw it was the mantis creatures that were approaching, though a few of the vampires walked through silently, their eyes glowing. The two apex predators didn't seem inclined to attack each other. I wondered if maybe the vampires had even domesticated the giant mantis creatures somehow. It didn't seem likely, but who knew? We started shooting as soon as they broke the boundary of the woods. The mantis creatures shrieked like dying women, emitting deafening wails as their legs, chests, and heads were blown apart by shotgun and rifle fire. But more and more kept coming, and some were now coming from the field and road as well. We were slowly being surrounded, and our ammo was not unlimited. A vampire ran at my mother. I saw it in slow motion, the creature popping out from the grassy field and sprinting. My father was busy firing that rifle like a madman, trying to keep the mantis creatures from overtaking us. I knew it was a hopeless task, but I could at least save my ma. I raised the shotgun, the vampire only a few feet away from me now, and shot it point blank in the face. Its head disintegrated into a mask of gore, droplets of blood flying. My mouth had been open. I was breathing hard, terrified and in the middle of battle fever, you see, and a few droplets of that strange, dark blood splattered directly into my mouth. I hadn't even realized what had happened until I tasted it. It tasted nothing at all like human blood. Nothing like sucking on a cut thumb after a small injury. Nothing like the taste of a bloody, rare steak. No, this blood was sweet and somehow cloying. It was an artificial sweetness, like some fake sugar you might put in coffee, combined with a vague metallic aftertaste. I started to spit after I realized what had happened, but by that point, we were being overrun. My neighbor was ripped apart part in front of me, his old, weather-beaten face showing a final expression of shock and horror as a mantis bit him across his body, right where his heart lay. Blood spurted from the wound. The mantis gingerly pushed the body parts apart and began to suck at the blood from the spurting injuries. Another followed silently behind and started feeding on the other half. I watched it all in horror until a hand grabbed my shoulder. I spun and saw Wesley. We need to go now, he said, pulling me. My da and ma and the others. I screamed. He shook his head. He was closest to me. As we became overrun, the creatures had split us into smaller groups. Wesley's brother and my ma and da were one of them. We had at least five mantis creatures and a few more vampires between us. As dozens more came running towards us, towards commotion and the prospect of a warm meal, I realized Wesley was right. But I fired all the same, taking down one of the mantis creatures with a slug to the torso. Its dark blood covered the dirt as it squealed and fell over, kicking its legs slowly and rhythmically like a flipped turtle as it died. My da and Wesley's brother were still shooting. I thank god that we each had a sack of ammo, but mine was feeling light. I looked down and saw only a dozen more slugs maybe. They must be getting low too. I knew I would have to come back for them when things had calmed down. But for now, I fled. 
Wesley ran ahead of me, his coarse work clothes flapping in the wind. We sprinted across the yard. I looked back and saw one of the mantis creatures running us down, moving much faster than either of us could ever hope to run. I stopped, turning. It felt like I was facing down a charging train. I raised the gun and with a shot to the head, I dropped it only 10 feet away from me. It kept running for a second, a body without any brain to run it. Then it began to fall forward, sliding, its legs kicking kicking and trembling as it died. He had a shelter behind his house, apparently. It was little more than a root cellar in the backyard of his house, but it was hidden and underground. He pulled the latch on the hatchway, opening it and motioning for me to go first. I ran forward, climbing down the short ladder. He followed, keeping the hatchway open for light while he started a gas lamp with some flint. Once we were situated, he closed the hatch. It was able to be locked from the inside, and was reinforced against tornadoes, with wood and concrete forming the walls. We also had some supplies down there, water and jars of pickled foods and jerky. Not much variety, but it would do. We stayed down there for two days. When we came back up, the creatures were gone. They had even taken their dead with them. I didn't know where they had gone, though I assumed it was back into the caves. They had left our dead, however. However, countless bodies lay all around the surrounding towns. I saw endless dead in the downtown area when I went down there, and I never saw my Da or Ma again. I never even found their bodies. Perhaps they had been dragged off into the woods, or perhaps the creatures took a few bodies back with them, maybe as souvenirs or just for some fresh meat. All of the people who died in the Battle of Scarville were reported as casualties from the Great War or the Spanish Flu, but those of us who were there know what we saw, and these were no flu victims. Thousands of bodies around the town had all the blood drained from them. I wonder why those creatures from underground didn't keep going. After all, they had won the Battle of Scarville, which was really just more of a massacre. But then I thought about how deer hunters are only allowed to hunt so many per season, to allow their population to regrow every year, and I thought about those abominations under the earth, and I wondered if maybe, just maybe, they might not be doing the same to us, waiting for the human population to grow for a hundred years or so, then, when the population is fat and healthy and lazy, come back out to feed on the herd. The old man stopped, clearing his throat and looking over at me. His story had apparently come to an end. He smiled slightly at me but I kept looking at him suspiciously, waiting for some sort of punchline. You realize how insane that whole story sounds? I asked after a few moments. The old man with his withered face just grinned at me, and in the dying light of the setting sun, I could have sworn his eyes were glowing. 